Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherry Williams, Chief of Operations at Global Partnership for Telehealth. And it is my honor and pleasure to meet our last, but maybe most entertaining speaker of the day. I had the pleasure of having dinner and dessert with this young man last night. And um, you were in, uh, in, in store for, for quite an entertaining um, event. Um, I did see a couple people walk out a few minutes ago. Probably they heard that he plans to speak until six o'clock, but we've asked him to keep it a little shorter than that, so hopefully he will. Um, many of you met him last year at our fall forum at the Great Wolf Lodge, and just an absolutely wonderful speaker. He was with Columbus State University last year, and I think Georgia Tech heard how brilliant he was. So over the past year, Georgia Tech has snatched him up, and he now serves as a senior project manager for cyber security at Georgia Tech. Um, some of the things you may not know about him is that Michael is a survivor of Georgia Tech's drown proofing course, both literally and figuratively. Um, he is a fan of healthy fat based diets. Um, he's a private detective. I did not know this or I would have been more cautious with what I was telling you last night. Um, and he's a stand-up comedian. I, I think when you retire, when you go on the road with your RV, I think you should have a stand-up comedian gig somewhere along the way. But it's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Barker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rena and Dr. Sumner, for uh, inviting me back. I guess I didn't offend enough people last year. So, well, that first joke fell flat. <laughs> How about this? I was in the kitchen the other day cooking and my wife, that probably for some of y'all, that, that's a joke, right? That the husband is in the kitchen cooking. Anyway, I was, I was in the kitchen cooking. My wife came in and we were talking and I was whispering and she said, why are you whispering? And I said, well, I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to hear me. And she laughed and I laughed and Siri laughed and Alexa laughed and we just all had a good time. So anyway, and thank you to whoever had Diet Dr. Pepper. So that, that is sustained me today. I love Diet Dr. Pepper. But we're going to roll through this, uh, try to get out of here before 6 o'clock. I'm the only thing between you and your weekend. And how many of y'all have already or are planning to, when you leave here, stopping at the Bucky's? Yeah. OK, what's up, Bucky's? <laughs> You have not had your a good education if you have been this close to Bucky's and did not go. So I'll leave it for you to find out what Bucky's is. All right, uh, on your table there's a little bit of a survey. Um, thank you, Amanda, for putting that together uh, so that you could do it on your phone. Basically, what that is, that's something you can do. Take back to uh, your management and have them kind of run through this survey. And the more knows or the don't know you answer uh, that's really kind of more at the more risk that your company is at when it comes to cybersecurity. And so the QR codes are on a brochure or a flyer on your table, but I'll also have this back up at the end of the presentation. So last uh, year, and I'm probably going to be in trouble here, is this thing working? Can I do this? Uh, uh, no. I can I get a handheld? Because I cannot stand here. <laughs> that's one, two. Perfect. All right, that's much better. I have to move. Um, so I always tell my students, if it's one thing that you want to do, if, you, if you're just dying to go get a tattoo, as a cybersecurity student, go tattoo this on your body somewhere. Because if you do not understand confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I think this will work. Can you explain it? You can't pick it up except if it's uh, Or availability, then you're going to flunk the course. So, what is CIA? And that's the whole, really the whole underpinning of cybersecurity confidentiality, keeping that information confidential, integrity. That means that that information has not been altered. It has not been deleted. And then availability is that it is there and present when you need it. And availability can be something as simple as the power went out. For y'all, the internet went out, right? So if the internet goes out and you don't have availability. Still hot swaps. 
hot swap. That way he'll pick you up on the camera. Yeah, okay. Is he gonna have to go back and forth on the camera? Testing, one, two, three. It's got, got me? Oh, uh, you know what, it's not. It's just well, that's fine, so, I got a big mouth. I had, a, I, had a, I had a deaf mother live with me for 12 years. They're still going, Dad, I can hear you. You don't have to speak like that. Yeah. So anyway, CIA, but then there's also some other things when we talk about cybersecurity, and that is uh, privacy. Now that's the big thing, right? It's not just that it's available, but that it is being kept private. And so another little lesson about cybersecurity, some just defining our terms, and we have network security. What is network security? It's how you build the networks, how you pull it out of the box, how you configure the server, the laptop, the internet, whatever it is to secure, to build the fortress. And then information security is what is important to protect. I always tell the story that I had a client, their server went down, I had to spend all weekend, I got them back up, new server, got everything up and running. The president calls me into his office, I'm thinking, maybe a bonus, right? I got you back up and running, right? I may have told this story last year. He said, I am so upset. And I'm like, what are you upset about? And he said, I downloaded 10,000 songs from iTunes over the last 10 years, and I have 100 playlists, and they're not there. <laughs> they had been wiped out on the server. Did I back them up? No. Did I back up what was making them millions of dollars a year and got them back up and running? Yes. Did I back up his iTunes playlist? No, because it wasn't important to me as the IT person. So information security is what is important enough to protect? Is this the Christmas pictures from last Christmas party that you're protecting, or is it patient health information, right? So then the information assurance is why the heck do we have to be compliant? It's because the government says so now, right? And that's where HIPAA, high tech, all those kind of rules come in. So that's the where, the how, the what, and the why. Back in the old days, when I would walk into a company, if I said, where's your firewall, and they could actually show me a firewall, I'd give them about 20 points. If they could then say, oh yeah, well, we use passwords, and it's more than password, or ABC123, we had a strong password, I'd give them another 20%. If they actually did backups, or knew what a backup was, another 20%, and if they did some sort of email phishing test, well, wow, they were really doing well, and uh, I'm sorry, I start with ant firewall, and then firewall, start with antivirus if they had antivirus. But many times I'd say, you got antivirus? They go, oh yes, yeah. uh, what kind of antivirus? I don't know, it came when I bought the laptop. When you buy the laptop, oh, three to five years ago. Have you renewed that laptop, I mean that antivirus? You mean you gotta pay for it? <laughs> came free on the laptop, didn't it? Yes, for a year or three months, but then you need to renew it. That's gonna come into critical point, right, when we start talking about work from home, right? So this is what I saw in my days from 2020, uh, 2000 to 2017. And I used to tell my clients, you know, the reason you need cybersecurity is because it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when you're gonna be hacked. Well, that's not what I say to them today. Now I walk in and I say, tell me your story, right? Was it last week, last year? Was it ransomware attack? Was it some sort of malware? Tell me how you have already lost data because we're at the point where now everybody's been affected. So now I have a little bit different stay, saying. I say, it's, in the end, it's not gonna matter if you have a few scars, but it will matter if you didn't live. What do I mean by that? I mean by that because 60% of small to medium-sized businesses that have a ransomware or serious malware attack will not be open within six months. I had a client one time, the server went down, again, spent my life 24 hours for so many days, getting them back up and running, getting walking out to my July 4th holiday. I left them sitting there manually re-entering their 100,000 product database over the holiday weekend because it was not backed up. It was totally lost. Could they do business within six months if they didn't know who bought for them, who they owed, 
when it was supposed to be coming in, how do you pay, right? So you can see the, the impact on small to medium sized businesses. So now I say, life is not a matter of holding good cards, but of playing a poor hand well, because we've all been dealt a poor hand when it comes to cybersecurity. We have to be right how, what percentage of the time? 100% of the time. How many times does the enemy have to be successful? Once. See, Ben, you're great students. Come, I like you in my class already. So if we look at the federal government, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, they have defined 16 critical infrastructures in the United States. Healthcare is one of those critical infrastructure. And infra critical infrastructure is something that if it were to be taken away, go down, or we couldn't access it, it would critically impact our lives. So if transportation went down three days with no groceries, we'd have anarchy. We almost saw that right in COVID when all the peanut butter and bread was gone. Or was it the toilet paper? <laughs> and, so, and then we have, you know, if, if the transportation or uh, you know, electricity goes out, right? For those of us, we might actually get cold right now Ooh, in Georgia. So think about those poor people overseas that can't get their Russian oil right now, right? So that's a critical infrastructure. Georgia, for the ninth year in a row, has been named the number one place to do business. This is great for Georgia, but it's really bad for all these companies that are trying to hire people. So our unemployment rate, the United States has had a negative unemployment rate. We've got more jobs than we have people. Georgia is in that same sort of situation. Why? Well, all kinds of different reasons. Is one is, who's just said we were getting old? Right, 10,000 people a day are retiring in the United States. We've got the gray tsunami of people leaving, or somebody calls it the silver tsunami. And then we have the great resignation, where people started, you know, navel gazing during COVID, going, why am I in this job? I want to change jobs. And they're leaving and changing jobs and going finding other things. And so we are in this desperate situation. If we go out there and look in healthcare alone, the hundreds of jobs that are available just in telehealth. So where are you going to find these people? Well, that's, that's your problem, not mine, right? My problem is that I've got to find people to fill these positions in all kinds of industry. And one of the way people are filling these positions, and you're probably seeing it some in telehealth as well, is through what's called Industry 4.0. Anybody not know what Industry 4.0 is? Okay, good. One person that'll take it so I can talk about it. All right. So basically, Industry 4.0 is where we have started using digital things like the Internet of Things to do things for us that we normally couldn't do. And in a lot of industry, Industry 4.0 is taking the place of people. So we're being able to put in smart devices that can do things for people that we can't hire. So that is, you can see all of the little things there that, that says Industry 4.0. But if we look in the medical industry, the medical industry is taking huge advantage of Industry 4.0. Those are all kinds of little technical devices, including you know our wearable technology, right? But think of all the electronic things that we hang on people. And so what we're doing is simply taking what used to be, for me, a very manageable small footprint that I had to secure, and now we're putting it in places I have no clue where it's at. I have, you know, is it down at the end of that dirt road? That that, who somebody said, is that a house? Right? Yeah. It, it, is there, is there an, a, an Internet of Things device down there? How do I protect that endpoint when I don't even know where the endpoints are now? And it's so expanded out. And that's part of what we call the ITOT convergence, which is creating havoc uh, in the cybersecurity world. Information technology and what's called operational technology. All those little IoT devices. And I, guess what all those little IoT devices do? They create data. data. Data 
data, data, and oh, and more data. Right, and more data, which has to be what? CIA and privacy. So you can see the problem that there just continues to increase. Good for health, good for people, good for learning and developing new things. Uh, but then we take it and we put it in our systems. And so now we've got all of these uh, enterprise resource planning systems and plugging all this data in. And again, what we've done is just create more and more areas and opportunities for exposure for attacks. And then of course, as we all know, we send everybody home. And as I just said, you mean you're supposed to pay for that mal anti-malware every year, right? So we took people that were siloed in a company where they had people to help protect them, to teach them, to test them, and we sent them home really with no tools. I mean, I was sitting at CSU uh, the week before we were shut down, and they were telling all the faculty, take what you need, grab what you need, and head to the hills, because we're about to be shut down. And I'm hearing professors saying, I'm going to grab my USB or my external drive and download all the data I need. Anybody know what FERPA is? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm sitting over there going, oh my gosh, what are you doing, right? Oh yeah, I'm going to download all that of uh, my students' information, take it home on a thumb drive, plug it into my unprotected computer. <laughs> Ooh, doggies. All right. So what we're doing is creating more and more windows for the thief to get into. The way I like to build my houses are uh, with very few windows, right? I like to, I like, I'm not big about sunlight, okay? Let's be a vampire, right? So, and then people say, well, you know, that's what cyber insurance is for. And a lot of people have bought cyber insurance, but the problem with cyber insurance is cyber insurance has gotten smart, or maybe they've gotten poor, because so many people are now exercising their cyber security, uh, cyber insurance, that the rates have gone up like eight to 10 times and what they cover has gone down. And you know, uh, we've got a condo at Hilton Head, and when Hurricane Matthew came through, because it was a named storm, our insurance did not cover that. So I wound up, I was the treasurer of the HOA, I wound up having to rebuild 14 units with a million dollars from FEMA, right? because the government covers that because it's a named storm. So anybody heard of Petya? It was, a, it was an attack. It was a named attack. If you have a named attack now, like a named storm, and you don't take care of your systems to prevent that named attack, guess what cyber insurance doesn't do? They don't pay, right? So they're getting just like smart like their other insurance, right? So act of war, name cyber attack, and then a lot of companies, we buy stuff over time, right? So we bought a bunch of computers. You probably got, how many of y'all can tell me you got a computer's running 10 years? My, that computer sitting over there has probably been running at least 10 years on me, right? What I paid for it. So I bought a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. I got, and I got this big IT infrastructure. I walk into companies all the time and say, give me a list of all your assets. They, don't, they said, we don't have a clue. We don't know what all we own. Well, if the place burned down tomorrow, how are you going to replace it? And what's it going to cost? Because now if I replace that, it's two and a half times what I paid for it because of supply chain shortages, chip shortages, et cetera. So, Again, how do you actually replace it if you don't know what you have? Whoop. So, like, a, like just about every industry of those 16 different critical infrastructures, telemedicine is on the hit list. It's not just that you've got a lot of information that bad actors would like to have, social security numbers, medical insurance card information, etc., that they can fill out their files on people from the stuff they've already stolen, like their credit card information, etc. You know, it's the impact on potential medical devices. So everybody in the room's got a pacemaker, push a button, everybody's pacemaker in the room stops. How quickly could we respond to an event like that, right? 
And we see that in small little ways where the enemy is testing that here and there, reaching out to their tentacles to see how well they can get into these systems. So these are just a couple of the late, latest articles. That's his latest, September 22nd, where they've pin tested uh, networks, devices, et cetera, and how vulnerable they are. Because when they develop products like this, nobody's thinking cybersecurity. Cybersecurity always gets bolted on later, not designed into the initial architecture. So I'm going a little off course here, but uh, some my kids like to play this little game. One of these is not like the others. Who can tell me which one is not like the other two? Center. <laughs> yeah. The United States Department of Defense has been bleeding our military technology for years. And we're watching very valuable technology that protects the military interests and, the, and all the other interests of the United States being stolen piece by piece by piece by piece. And so I, that's one of the things that I was brought to Georgia Tech for. I'm working with defense contractors all over the state trying to get them into this new what's called CMMC certification so that we can protect all of this stuff because you would not Anybody know there's 800 aerospace manufacturers in the state of Georgia alone? 800. Yes. That doesn't include all the gun manufacturers, the uh, automobile manufacturers. It's 10% uh, of Georgia's economy. And they have like zero cybersecurity. You would be very shocked. <laughs> So, very scary. So, uh, yeah, and so we don't have the cybersecurity talent. We're short 750,000 entry level cybersecurity professionals. So, how do we go out there and actually protect when we don't have the individuals to go out and do the, what's needed through even these manufacturers or healthcare or whatever? You can't hire them because they don't exist. Last year, I talked about some of the things we were doing at CSU to grow the next generation in some rapid workforce development programs. But what I want to talk to you about is, this is what I still see when I walk out most companies. That's about the extent of it, right? So here we are, all these years later, I stepped over into CSU for a few years. I stepped back out kind of doing what I used to do with companies walking in, doing gap and security assessments. And I'm seeing the same thing. This is about it when it comes to cybersecurity. So let's talk about some of the new philosophies so you may hear these terms down the road, can speak a little more intelligently when it comes to cybersecurity. One is we don't have to start from scratch. We have frameworks. So you may hear of the NIST cybersecurity framework. That's a kind of a baseline cybersecurity framework. It walks you through five different things that you need to do, five areas you need to look at in your profession. And it applies across the board. 80% of major companies have gone in and complied to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Then you have ISO 27001, which is cybersecurity, and 27701, which is privacy. That's another framework you can use to measure your company and how you uh, measure up to cybersecurity. And then if you do any work, anybody here thinking they want to do work with the Department of Defense, telehealth, you will have to be in compliance with CMMC. It will be for all suppliers and all contractors. It's been coming in the middle of next year, the door closes and hundreds of thousands of manufacturers are gonna have to stop working for the DOD because they don't meet this cybersecurity requirement. The DOD is very serious about us bleeding off to proxy state actors who have been stealing our technology. But it doesn't matter what you do for the DOD. Make bandages, CMMC compliance. That's just where I've been traveling around the state doing some of these over the last few months. They've been keeping me busy. So let's talk about cybersecurity and what some of these frameworks talk about. Zero trust. The old philosophy was trust but verify. You had a username, you had a password, you could log in 
and that was it. You were on the network, you were on the system, right? Most of these companies, it's small, it's mom and pop, it's husband and wife, it's cousins, uncles, uh, you know, nephews. You all go to church together, you all eat Sunday dinner together, your kids play baseball or basketball or soccer or lacrosse or whatever together. It's just family. Now, man, I don't trust nobody. <laughs> I don't care if you're my wife. <laughs> Ask her if she knows my passwords. <laughs> All the time she's trying to get in there and find out how many girlfriends I got. I'm like, no, honey. That, sorry. So now we're on zero trust. You prove you are who you say you are. You suspect everyone. You treat the network like it's already compromised. You assume the threats internal and external are always present. You do something called separation of duty. You don't have your AR person and your AP person being the same person, you know, in your accounting, for example. That's separation of duties. Uh, non uh, principle of least privilege. The president of the company does not need access to all the files and all of the folders. But how many of my companies have been uh, attacked by ransomware simply because the president of the company says, I don't care, I want you to give me access to everything. So then when he pushes that spam button and opens up that software, then I get the call that 750,000 files got encrypted in four minutes on the server and they're shut down because he needed full access. So principle of least privilege. Non-repudiation means that you can't say anymore, well, I don't know, some malware must have got on my, on my computer and typed in porn <laughs> in Google. We go, no, it was you. We got ways of, <laughs> no, sorry. You know, so, and that's part of monitoring, logging, audit. All these are different systems that have to be added in, and they're expensive, but they really are needed now to be able to say that who is sitting there is somebody that we can audit back and know that that was the person is there because it, particularly DOD, you sign what's called a DFARS clause in your contract, it means that the DOD is going to, if you have a cyber incident, a breach, they're coming in and they want to see you be able to do digital forensics and tell them how this happened. You have to have the logs or you're going to expect some fines. And this goes for physical security as well. I don't know how many of my plants, first day, I walk in, no badge, no nothing, there's a security guard reading the newspaper, I walk by, they never acknowledge me, the gate's wide open, I walk in, I'm checking doors, doors in the back are unlocked to the woods, right? And I'm, I'm walking all around, hey, how you doing, good to see you, yeah, yeah, How's, can you tell me where the restroom is, yeah, yeah, do you know where the critical data is, I'd like to steal some. Anybody got a laptop laying around? I mean, you know, we're just all good friends, right? And I'm sitting there telling them, <laughs> I'm sorry, you need to put a fence up, put the bob wire up, the security guard, give him more than a flashlight, all right? Make him walk around. So, so we, again, it's this zero trust. You know, it goes back to, oh, you wake up in the middle of the night, you walk outside in your underwear, you look down, and there's somebody downstairs, you go, hey, what are you doing in my house? I got your key. Oh, well, if you got my key, then you must be welcome in my house. <laughs> you know? I, I'm your son. Well, you don't look like my son, but if you got the key, then you must. That's the old method, right? If somebody had your username and password, it was you. Now, we want to make sure that it is you. So physical security, we talked about that, putting guards, gates, all kinds of good stuff around your data. Uh, badges, <laughs> I'm doing an exit interview, the plant manager's sitting there, and I said, uh, you know, one of my findings is that your policy states that everyone will have badges, that they will be worn, that they are, you know, 24 seven, blah, 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 blah. He goes, where did you find that? <laughs> this is the plant manager now. Where'd you find that? He said, I've never seen that. The corporate guy that flew down from Massachusetts sat there and said, it's a global company. He said, this is our global badge policy. <laughs> and the plant manager didn't know the policy, never read it, and nobody at the site was wearing badges. So, you know, again, we are family. Why do we need policies and procedures? I, how do you do such and such? You can tell me how you do such and such. Now I ask you how you do the same thing, and you say, here's how we do it. Did you both do it the same way, right? 
So if it's not documented, as an auditor or an assessor, I say, if it's not documented, it doesn't exist, right? Because now there's no consistent process, nothing to hold people accountable, nothing to verify, audit, and nothing to present in court or the government or the, De the Department of Defense if they come knocking at your door after a breach. So needs to be reviewed, needs to be kept updated. For the DOD, the CMMC stuff that I'm doing, that's just a few of the policies and procedures we expect to see when we show up. Spend time writing those puppies up for the next year and a half, right? And there, I, I know that sounds bad, but there are actually things out there you can download and templates and all to work on these policies and procedures. Control, everything needs to have a control on it. Control access, control your media. You know, if you've got a little USB, do you allow USB? Do you allow use of USB? Do you allow USBs to be stuck in a device? Do you allow them to go home? Are they encrypted, right? So controls, everything that we put in place is a control to help control the loss of data. So, uh, let's just, we'll keep that. Oh, contractors. Control your contractors. So many companies will use a managed service provider, third party contractor, right? Because you're out in rural Georgia, who's taking care of your IT systems? But then I walk in, I say, okay, show me a list of all your username and passwords. Well, we don't have that. Who has it? Our third party contractor, our MSP. Well, show me a list of all your assets. We don't have that. Who has it? Well, our managed service provider has it. All right, I'm firing your managed service provider tomorrow. How are you gonna start up your network? Right, because usually when I came in to a company, it was because the other person or company was being fired. And you know what? For some reason, they didn't wanna hand over all that information to me, right? And so I literally sometimes had to blow servers and firewalls and stuff away and reconfigure them in order to put usernames and passwords in there because the old, and I always say, so who should be in control of that? The managed service provider or you, right? HR, hire them, train them, fire them correctly. If somebody is a problem at company A, they're gonna be a problem at your company. If they walked out of, walked out with your database of all your clients from company A, they're gonna do the same with your company. And I've seen it happen over and over again. So there's a lot of things you can do, background checks, citizenship tests that you're required to do, et cetera. But there's also such things as integrity checks. Um, the last company I was at, I said, do you, do you check their references? Do you check their credentials? They go, no. I'm like, really? You don't check their references? Okay, and then termination, how to fire, how to lock them out. I'd walk in one company, I'd say, where's Sam? Oh, Scott had let Sam go. We just didn't have enough work. Where's Sam's, what, what one, why didn't anybody call me? Oh, well, we didn't think about it. How long Sam been gone? Oh, about a week now. Like, where's Sam's technology? Where's his cell phone and laptop? Well, you know, Scott said that Sam, he'd have to be looking for another job and, you know, he didn't have a laptop, so Scott just let him keep his laptop, <laughs> keep, his, keep his cell phone. I said, his laptop and his cell phone that have VPN access into the server with all of your, you know. So how do you fire them correctly? What time of the day do you fire them? There's a process for this from cybersecurity. You lock them out, then you walk them out. All right, and then, uh, managing risk, we already heard that you need to have a risk assessment. It's one of the things that companies don't do. Every decision you make opens up or narrows down a risk. And a lot of the decisions we make, like I said, oh, let's buy this tablet, right? Okay, so I'm doing an assessment. I look, I say, give me an inventory. And they show me and I say, you're using Lenovo laptops. What's wrong with Lenovo laptops? Made in, China. Made in China. And if you go back and search Lenovo laptops for the last 10 years, they've had a security issue. They have something on them that might phone home, and it's not to the US, okay? So we need to buy some equipment. 
you got to do a risk assessment on that equipment because you may be opening up a back door to the information you're putting on that system to allow it to go someplace else. It's why the United States government is going through and very tightly restricting what can and cannot be purchased and put on government networks. Secure network architecture, I just talked about that. Plan it at the beginning, put it all together and create a plan. What I found was somebody say, oh, well, we need an email solution. So they go buy an email solution. Oh, we need a, you know, this kind of solution, a firewall solution, blah, 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 blah. And they bolt it on. And they don't have the time, the talent, the resources, the people, et cetera, to do it right. So they buy something because a vendor said, this is the number one product. They spend a lot of money. They come and the vendor comes and sticks it in there. Nobody looks at it at the company. Nobody monitors at the company. And you're no more secure than when you start it, because nobody there understands it, knows how to use it, knows how to get the data out and what to do with the data. So design your system up front and make sure it all works well together. And then we kind of talked about this, uh, you know, if you're an IT, if you're an international company, I've, I'm dealing with international companies right now, and I walk into their US plant and I go, who has access? You've got manufacturing sites all over the world. That one over there in China, how do those people access the network? Oh, well, they can come through our network in order to get, and I go, you're telling me that China has direct access into this network, right? So again, what networks are you connecting into? What are your partners? And what are your partners, how are they connected? How are they doing their cybersecurity uh, auditing on whoever their managed service provider or their third party contractors or anybody that they've got an agreement with, how are they keeping data secure if they somehow have access into your network? And then having incident response, having some sort of looking at, looking at supply chain, right? Okay, so you start buying something and this is gonna be critical that you're rolling out across the state and then you can't get it tomorrow or you can't get service on it tomorrow. That's part of that risk assessment, right? Because we're in the middle of a supply chain crisis. And so also doing such things as a, having a business continuity or a disaster recovery plan. 80% of the companies out there do not have a disaster recovery plan or a business continuity plan, which means that let's say that someone cuts. You know, you're in rural Georgia and the backhoe the proverbial backhoe cuts the internet connection. How many days can you stay out of business? What backup plan do you have? Cuts the power. What's your plan, right? So those are the kind of things that part of your risk assessment, building in some sort of plan to say, how do we take care of this? And then there's a bunch of other things that you can do uh, that are required if, in certain of these different um, frameworks. Last year I said I was going to talk about cloud, so I just covered for a couple of minutes. A lot of what we can do today is because we can do it in the cloud. It provides us uh, the opportunity to do things less expensively because we're not buying that physical iron and having to set it somewhere in a closet and configure it and hire people to manage it. But one of the things with cloud, and now that everything is a service, so you can literally get uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, apps as a service. I've got a company that offers telephones as a service. So if you give your employees iPhones, every two years they'll change them out for you. You just rent them. So everything is a service, right? And the closer you get, from, or farther you get from on-premises, which is in the left-hand column, right? And those are all the things that you would have done on site, on premises, on servers, laptops, whatever your, your infrastructure. As you move more and more, the first is infrastructure as a server, service, then platform as a service, and then adding software as a service. Basically, by the time you get to the right hand column, everything in your network is up in the cloud. All you need is an internet connection. Everything else is up there, and a laptop or you know, uh, you know, something like that. So this is just kind of defining, and you'll have these you can look at later. And there's all kinds of upcoming trends. Everything just continues to move more and more in the cloud, which then allows us to do more and more things with our clients, with our patients, with whatever. 
But just because it's in the cloud, just because it is no longer on your premises, guess who's responsible for security? You are. The misnomer with cloud is that, oh, I'm using AWS. They're taking care of my security. Read the clause, not the Santa clause. <laughs> the little clause that basically said, all we're doing is spinning up a virtual server for you. Anything you put on there, just like you protected it when it was hardware on, in your site, it is the same sort of security that you have to put on it in the cloud. So all of those things that I just talked about, you know, uh, trust no one, zero trust, you put that in the cloud, okay? All of those things. So seven fundamentals, understand what you're responsible for, control user access, data protection, secure credentials, multi-factor authentication. All of those are still your responsibility even when it's in the cloud. So here's some, just some practices. Again, you can read because I don't want to walk, uh, spend all your time here this afternoon. But if you're doing any sort of government work, for example, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to spin up the cloud and use the cloud. If you're doing any sort of federal things, then there's something called FedRAMP and your cloud has to be FedRAMP certified, which means it's on a list that it meets certain federal requirements for uh, being a secure cloud site. And then we also talked about CMMC, which is if you're doing any work for the DOD. So to wrap it up, uh, the question is, you know, we could spend some time here, tell me what kind of cybersecurity stories have you already experienced, either personally or in your business. And with the thought is, how long did it shut you down for? So then think about how much would you make in a day, therefore how much if you were shut down for a week, because that's kind of an average if you've got a ransomware attack, how much income would you lose for a week being shut down? If you're doing work with the Department of Defense and you're not CMMC certified by next summer, and you lost your DOD contracts. I mean, we are literally, I think it's about $15 billion of income from the DOD here in the state of Georgia. Think of that economic hit next year if these companies could not renew their DOD contracts. $15 billion alone would wipe, be wiped out of the state and all those thousands of jobs which support that. So that's really uh, it for me. I just want to add up, you know, if you need help with cybersecurity, uh, what I do at Georgia Tech is part of now economic development, going out and helping retain jobs, helping to grow companies and so they can get more jobs. So that's what I'm working with is all of this cybersecurity requirements, doing risk and gap assessments for these clients. And the survey is something that again, you can uh, take back, I think there's a physical copy of it in your packet, hand it to management or whoever and, and walk through that. Like I said, the more no's, then the more it is that you're probably uh, uncovered when it comes to cybersecurity and some things you should think about. And so again, what we do, I'm in what's called the MEP section, which is the manufacturing section. I'm working strictly with manufacturers, but we have various other segments within the group that I'm in. One of them is healthcare. So uh, we have 10 regional managers. There's a manager somewhere in your area. If you wanna reach out to one of the regional managers in your area and talk to them about how they can help you in the healthcare arena, we also are uh, just fired up uh, this advanced center, global center for medical innovation. So uh, that's another whole area. This is Dean Hettenbach, he's over that. So if you're doing anything, uh, medical startups, medical manufacturing, anything like that, we're involved in that as well. Uh, part of the uh, ATDC, which is the uh, startup uh, segment of Georgia Tech, 
And then these are some of the other things we do. Strategy, leadership development, process improvement, sustainability, supply chain, food quality and safety. I actually spoke at the food safety um, group a few weeks back. And so with that, I'll leave it. There's my business card at the far right, but we also have some other products that you may want to look at just from a resource standpoint from Georgia Tech. With that, ooh, 15 minutes to spare. Nobody can say how oh, the cyber guy kept me here all weekend. Any questions? All right. Thank you very, very much. Well, I want to thank you all. Thank you.